Two hopes prompted Sparta's decision to restart the war with Athens in 413 BC. Firstly, a roadmap was offered by Alcibiades, the young Athenian general who had been condemned in absentia and had fled to, fled and fled to Sparta. Here, he joined his new Spartan friends in their messes, cheerfully eating the black broth that other Greeks found so repellent. Alcibiades suggested that the Spartans establish a permanent fort in Attic territory, which would not only disrupt commerce, but would also prov provide a refuge to escaped slaves, especially the slaves that worked in the Laurion silver mines. The Spartan fort was established at Decalea in 413, roughly halfway between Athens and Marathon, and it had its desired effect. Yet ultimately, Sparta could not hope to bring Athens to her knees without a fleet, and ships cost money. Sparta had been late to adopt coinage, still using iron spits as primitive currency. There was no way that the Spartans were in a position to fund a large war fleet. The Spartans therefore turned to the wealthiest power in the eastern Mediterranean, the Achaemenid Persians. And the Persians had reason to help the Spartans. The Athenians were materially supporting a Persian rebel named Amorges, and for Persia, Sparta promised to be a useful proxy to wield against the Athenians. We must, however, return to the colorful and ever scandalous career of Alcibiades. While in Sparta, he supposedly had managed to seduce the wife of King Aegis. This rumor seems to have been accepted by the Spartans themselves, as they subsequently refused to let Aegis' son succeed him on the belief that he was illegitimate. Within, with his position in Sparta tenuous, Alcibiades sought to join the Spartan fleet, but then defected to the court of the Persian satrap Tissaphernes at the first opportunity. Soon, Alcibiades was in contact with the generals of the Athenian fleet, informing them that the Persians might consider switching their support to Athens on the condition that Athens abolish its democracy. This message was soon transmitted to Athens, and an oligarchic coup struck in 411. An assembly was forced to meet and vote to abolish the democracy and replace it with an oligarchy governed by a council of 400 men. But the coup quickly fizzled. On Samos, where the Athenian navy was based, the sailors refused to acknowledge the legitimacy of the new government. Instead, they cashiered their generals, who were supportive of the coup, and voted new leaders. Ironically, one of these generals was none other than Alcibiades, who having first secretly promoted the coup, now joined the democratic resistance. In Athens itself, despite the murder of some opposition figures, the new oligarchic government could not maintain its hold. The idea that democracy was the only legitimate form of government was simply too strong, and the 400 still soon found their position tenuous. Within the oligarchy, rifts between hardliners and moderates opened, with the latter advocating expanding the franchise to the 5,000 men on the hoplite muster list, the Zugatai. The moderates won out, but the re-enfranchised hoplites quickly pushed for a full restoration of the democracy. By early 410, the Deimos was again in control of Athens. Now, the year 411 also marks a moment of transition for our sources. Thucydides breaks off practically mid-sentence, and he quite likely died with his history incomplete. Our main source for Greek political history is now Xenophon, who, like Thucydides, was an Athenian exiled in the Peloponnese. A prolific writer, his Greek history, the Hellenica, picked up where Thucydides left off and then carried the story down to the Second Battle of Matinea in 362 BC. Going back to the Peloponnesian War, in 410, the Athenians achieved a crushing victory over the Spartan fleet. 
The Spartans explored a new peace, but were rejected by the Athenian ecclesia. Athenian operations in this period now focused on the West Aegean and Hellespontine region. Alcibiades, still a general, even went as far as to start collecting tolls for commerce passing through the Bosphorus in 409. So far, Spartan attempts to hold their own at sea had failed. The Athenian navy still reigned supreme. One problem for the Spartans was the fact that Persian support had up to now been uncoordinated and oftentimes half-hearted, largely administered through the governors, the satraps, of the western regions. Enter, however, Cyrus the Younger, the cadet brother of the Persian, <clears throat> the, the, the cadet son of the Persian king Darius II, who had been given a regional command in western Anatolia. Ambitious, and perhaps hoping to establish himself as the superior candidate to succeed his father, he poured resources into the defeat of Athens. He found a partner in the Spartan general Lysander. Lysander was of low status, a Muthax, the bastard son of a Spartan father and a Helot mistress. But he was a skilled soldier and admiral, and he held great influence thanks to his sexual relationship with Agesilaus, the brother of King Aegis of Sparta. 406, Lysander and the Persian-financed fleet defeated the Athenian fleet at the Battle of Notium. Now, the fleet was commanded by a deputy, appointed by Alcibiades, while he oversaw a parallel, parallel operation elsewhere. The debacle resulted in Alcibiades being exiled from Athens for the last time. He fled to Persia, where he was given a small fief in Thrace before he was murdered shortly after the end of the war. The Athenians now dispatched a new fleet. Lysander's time in office was up, and he was replaced by a less inspired commander. The Athenians scored a victory over the Spartan fleet at Arginusae in 406 BC. However, in the immediate aftermath of the battle, a severe storm arose, and the Athenian generals halted attempts to recover both shipwrecked Athenian sailors as well as the bodies of the dead. In Athens, demagogues charged the generals with negligence, and arranged for an extraordinary trial before the ecclesia itself. The generals were convicted and sentenced to death. Among them was Pericles the Younger, the son of Pericles, by his mistress Aspasia. The executions left the Athenians bereft of military leadership. The new generals who took the fleet out in 405 to the Hellespont faced Lysander again. Spartan law forbade Lysander from serving twice as navarch or admiral, but the Spartans skirted the law by appointing Lysander as the deputy to a pliant successor, and then allowing him to exercise de facto command. Spartan fleet, paid for by Cyrus, prowled the Hellespont and caught the Athenian fleet negligently pulled up on the beach near Agispotami. The Athenians were crushed, losing virtually their entire fleet. The battle effectively ended the war. Lysander's fleet sailed to blockade the Piraeus, cutting off Athens' grain supply. The starving city finally capitulated in 404. The terms were harsh. The democracy was abolished and replaced by a pro-Spartan junta of 30 men, the so-called 30 tyrants. The Delian League was dissolved. The long walls were demolished to the sound of pipes. For Athens, the defeat seemed total. But democracy was, and is, a resilient thing. And so next time, we will examine the fall of the 30 tyrants and the restoration of the Athenian democracy. We'll talk soon.